the anthem of Greek. Hold up. That's actually a word? Before you translate this thing, let's start from the beginning. This piece of Greenland is called Greenland. You probably know it from its beautiful icebergs, colorful houses and magnificent northern lights. But Greenland is home to yet another hidden treasure that cannot be captured in just a single picture. I'm actually talking about the Greenlandic language, also known as Galashisut. Greenlandic is part of the Eskimo Aleut language family, which is one of the world's major language families. The first documented split within this family happened between the Eskimo and Aleut branches about 4000 years ago. A more recent split of about a thousand years ago happened between the Inuit and Yupik branches. The origins of the Eskimo Aleut languages remain shrouded in mystery, but it appears that the homeland of Proto Eskimo Aleut was located either in Alaska or Siberia. From this area, Inuit started to settle in the northern parts of Canada and eventually arrived in Greenland around 800 years ago. Interestingly, several cultures had settled in Greenland before but none of these cultures had managed to survive until the arrival of the Inuit. If we focus on the Inuit languages, we can see they can be subdivided into four larger groups. From west to east, these are Inupiaq, Western Canadian Inuit, Eastern Canadian Inuit, which includes Inuktitut, and lastly, Greenlandic. We can also see there is a language continuum, rather than a strict division between Inuit languages. This means neighboring languages tend to be more or less mutually intelligible. If we zoom in on Greenlandic, we can see three main dialects, considered separate languages by some. Kalashisut, also known as West Greenlandic, literally means like a Greenlander and is spoken by about 50,000 people. Tunumisut, or East Greenlandic, literally means like an inhabitant of the backside and is spoken by about 3,000 people. This name may seem a little strange, but Greenlanders orientate themselves by using their position relative to the sea. So, if you are facing the sea in West Greenland, then East Greenland will be located behind you, or on your backside. Lastly, Inuktun, or North Greenlandic, literally means like a human, and only has about 1,000 speakers. This dialect is actually more similar to Inuktitut than to Greenlandic. In this video series, we'll only look at the grammar of Kalashisut. Yes, you heard me. Grammar. Grammar may sound boring at first, but Greenlandic grammar is fascinating. Besides, I'll tell you many fun facts about the Greenlandic language. Take for example the Greenlandic word for northern lights, Asamnerit. Literally, this word means ball games. Yes, ball games. According to an old Inuit legend, the northern lights can be seen whenever the spirits of dead people are playing soccer with skulls. Pretty cool, huh? I've split up my video series into six parts covering different aspects of Greenlandic grammar. These are morphology, phonology, syntax, nouns, verbs, and lastly, demonstratives. In case all of this sounds like abracadabra, don't worry, we'll look at each of these concepts one by one. In this video, we'll start with part one, morphology. Morphology refers to the process of word formation in any language. One glance at just a single Greenlandic word may be enough to tell you that this language is vastly different from English. Greenlandic is notorious for its long sentence words, which, as the name suggests, can contain the meaning of an entire sentence in English. The word means you really can't pretend not to be hearing all the time. Right. To understand the translation of this word, we need to break it down into smaller bits. In other words, we need to have a closer look at its morphemes. Morphemes can be considered the smallest units of meaning. 
They are essentially the building blocks used to construct words in any language. Let's have a look at an example in English. Ironically enough, we can break up the word unbreakable into three separate morphemes, or building blocks. If we literally translate each morpheme, we get not, to break, possible. The verb to break is the so-called root of this word, and may also occur as a word on its own. The first morpheme is a so-called affix or prefix, because it is always attached to the beginning of a word. It can be used to obtain the negative meaning of a word, but it cannot occur on its own, which is why we call it an affix, and not a root. The last morpheme is also an affix, but since it is attached to the end of a word, it is called a suffix. In English, the potential to form different words by stacking affixes onto a single word stem is actually quite limited. Let's see how this compares to other languages, such as Greenlandic. Languages can be classified based on their morphology, or, to be more precise, based on their potential to form words by combining morphemes. This can be visualized as a spectrum from analytic to synthetic to polysynthetic languages, which also includes further subdivisions. Analytic languages tend to show very little inflection and often use words consisting of just a single morpheme. Modern English is an example of such a language. Isolating languages, such as Vietnamese, take this to an extreme and almost exclusively form words consisting of only one morpheme. Synthetic languages often combine morphemes to modify the meaning of a word. In fusional languages, these morphemes tend to fuse together so that the individual morphemes may be hard to tell apart. Also, a single morpheme in a fusional language may denote numerous grammatical features at once. For example, the suffix i in the Spanish word comi, meaning I ate, denotes the indicative mood preterite tense and first-person singular agreement, corresponding to I in English. In agglutinative languages, morphemes tend to remain much more distinct, as they are glued onto a word one by one. For example, the southern Quechuan word mikokani, or however that should be pronounced, also means I ate, but it contains two separate morphemes denoting the past tense and first-person singular agreement, unlike in Spanish. Polysynthetic languages are like a better, I mean, a more extreme version of synthetic languages. They tend to combine many morphemes into a complex word, which typically involves both fusion and agglutination. Also, many of these languages make extensive use of noun incorporation, which involves the inclusion of a noun root into a verb to give it a more specific meaning. Greenlandic is a schoolbook example of such a language, so let's have a look. In English, one morpheme often corresponds to one word, such as in the sentence I drink coffee. Wait, something's not right. Ah, better. In Greenlandic, it is possible to express that you drink tea as a habit by attaching multiple suffixes to just a single word root, resulting in a much higher morpheme per word ratio. If we literally translate each morpheme, then we get tea to drink, habitually, indicative mood, first person singular. Tsi is the root of this word, and obviously means tea. The suffix to means to consume or to drink, and incorporates the noun root tea into a verb meaning to drink tea, hence it is a verbalizer. Note that because this is a suffix, it cannot stand alone. There is no such word as to meaning to drink. It can only be attached to a noun root. The next affix, ta, indicates that this is a repeated action, which is also used for habits. Lastly, there is a verb ending that consists of a mood marker and a person marker. This verb has the indicative mood, which is used for general statements, and the first person singular corresponds to I in English. Now, let's colorize all of the affixes from the long sentence word that I showed you earlier. Ah, look at all those pretty colors. Going from left to right, the first morpheme we can identify is a verb root meaning to hear, followed by not and the intransitive participle. This may sound complicated, 
but it basically turns the verbal phrase to hear not into a noun meaning someone who doesn't hear or a deaf person. To put it differently, it is a nominalizer. This is immediately followed by a verbalizer meaning to pretend to be. In this case, to pretend to be someone who doesn't hear. Next comes a series of verbal suffixes, starting from continuously and only, which together can be translated as all the time. Next come three suffixes meaning can, not and really. This is followed by a verbal ending denoting the indicative mood second person singular, corresponding to you in the English. And this finally gives us the full translation, you really can't pretend not to be hearing all the time. Now let's talk about derivation, which is the formation of new words from existing words. Derivation plays a central role in the morphology of Greenlandic, so I'm going to show you how this process works. Take for example the word root okak, which is a noun meaning tongue. As you can see, this root can also be used as a verb meaning to speak. Let's see how the meaning of this verb root changes as we attach more suffixes to it. The first affix gives us okasak, which means word. However, a more literal translation would be speaking tool. Words can be used to speak, so they are essentially a tool for speaking. Note that the first affix is a nominalizer. By adding two more affixes, we get which means sentence. Literally, this means a pair of fellow speaking tools, or in proper English, a group of words. A sentence is basically a group of words. Even this word can be further modified to obtain a new word with a derived meaning. Now we have which means syntax. At this point, the literal translation is getting quite cryptic. Speak, tool, fellow, pair of, work with, abstract participle. The affix lori means to work with, in this case, to work with sentences. So it is a verbalizer that turns the noun sentence into a verb meaning to work with sentences. Lastly, we have a nominalizing suffix that simply turns the word into a noun again, so that the meaning becomes working with sentences. And this is exactly what syntax is about, because syntax refers to the analysis or structure of sentences. This example clearly shows that Greenlandic has a high potential for word derivation by attaching different suffixes to a common word root. In contrast, English often uses completely different word roots to denote concepts that are related in meaning. Because of this, you don't have to memorize as many word roots when learning Greenlandic compared to English, but instead you often have to memorize long words that are entire descriptions on their own. Alright, it's time for a fun fact. Did you know Greenlandic and other Eskimo languages have over a hundred words for different types of snow and ice? Or so they say. Interestingly, whether the statement is the truth or just a myth is still under debate, at least on the internet. To understand what all this fuss is about, we need to take a closer look at morphological derivation in Greenlandic. But I think I'll cover this in a separate video. Sorry guys. Let's wrap up what we've learned today. Greenlandic is part of the Inuit branch that belongs to the Eskimo Aleut language family. It is a polysynthetic language that is characterized by a high morphine per word ratio and extensive noun incorporation, which may result in long sentence words. Lastly, Greenlandic has a high potential for word derivation by attaching different suffixes to a relatively small number of word roots. That being said, let's have a quick look at one of the slides I showed you earlier. If you paid attention, you might have noticed that some letters went missing in the process of word formation. Can you see which ones? Let me help you for a second. In this example, the last letter of the word disappeared each time upon the addition of one or two affixes. Apparently, the addition of suffixes may involve sound changes that affect the final form of the word. 
If you want to be able to make Greenlandic words by yourself, you need to know the rules that describe these sound changes. In part 2 of this video series, we are going to look at the sound system, or the phonology, of the Greenlandic language. Thank you for watching my first video on the Greenlandic language. If Greenlandic is your native language, or if you are a learner of the language, what is the longest sentence word you've ever encountered? Please let me know in the comments. Also, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more videos. Tekus!